Thank you for joining us today as we are hopefully one day closer to a new normal and we hope that practices can soon operate at full schedules again. This webinar discusses just that. My name is Keith Dreyer of Henry Schein Practice Services and it is our honor to host you today. Today you will hear from four leading industry professionals who will provide insight on how to bring back your employees and patients when you reopen your practice. Throughout the presentation, I will be asking frequently asked questions to our presenters. This webinar and materials will be presented in the next hour is not intended to substitute for professional ad advice. Without further ado, I now hand it over to Ali Aramchaman, co-founder and chief executive officer of HR for Health, who will be discussing tips and musts to follow when your employees start working again. Ali, I'd like to turn it over to you now, please. Awesome, thank you, Keith. And, and you're absolutely right. This is a very exciting time for all of us in dentistry, although very scary as well, because finally, after almost five weeks to six weeks that we're approaching of being sheltered in place for most of the country, a lot of the states are starting to open up. And so if we can go to the next slides, we can kind of talk a little bit about what it takes to kind of get ready for this. And the first step in terms of opening up is really the new hire documents. And, and here's kind of the, the basis of all compliance when we talk about HR. Most of our dentists nationwide fall into really two major categories. Those that fired and terminated their employees while in sheltered in place or whatnot, and then those who furloughed them and maybe kept them on, on payroll. If you are in that category where you terminated all your employees, then you have to rehire all of them back on. And to do that properly, you need to go through the new hire documentation process again. Of course, if you're a Henry Schein customer, if you're an HR for Health customer, this is super, super easy for you because all you have to do is to go into HR for Health and submit the, the documents again to all your employees. They fill it out electronically again, all the latest forms statewide, and they will send it back to you electronically with electronic signatures. You're good to go. If you're not a HR for Health customer or a Henry Schein customer and you don't, you know, you haven't signed up yet, you will have to do all of these in paper. And so what that means is that you got to fill it out, have them uh, sign everything, send it back to you, either electronically or otherwise, and you got to verify all of the proper paperwork all over again. So this is the first step. Now, for many of us out in the industry, what really you know th this opportunity allows us to do is to update our employment manual. And that is truly your first line of defense is your employment manual. So make sure you've got it updated. You know, uh, the CARES Act and the FFCRA have a lot of new rules where, that require documentation, some of which we're gonna talk about shortly. So make sure you've got an updated manual um, and, uh, and, and then you can, get, you, you can be set to go to the next stage of hiring. But, but the first step is the new hire documents, the employment manual, um, you've got to make sure you got those from for a strong foundation. If we go to the next slide now, we can really talk about how do I um, avoid potential bias when I'm hiring these employees back on? And a frequent question that we get, Keith, is what if I don't want to bring everybody back on? What if there are people who I just don't feel are part of my A team? What do I do then? And our recommendations and advice have been that you really want to be careful in how you hire your team back on because the potential for bias in hiring you know, them back on incorrectly can happen. A lot of times we always worry about termination. We worry about discrimination when we're terminating somebody. If you guys have ever heard me speak you know, at a convention, you know I say you, know, you never want to terminate an old a pregnant or a disabled employee. Well, the same rules apply if you're hiring them back on. You gotta be very, very careful. So here's our recommendation. Make sure you set yourself up correctly by having some sort of program, a protocol, if you will, that allows you to bring somebody back on or your teams back on without it being questioned. I'll give you a common example. A common example would be, I'm gonna hire the ones that have the most tenure first, 
have been with me the longest, and then I'm going to slowly hire everybody else back on. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is if you bifurcate your team into like an A team, a rock star team, and then like a B team. Of course, don't go to them and be like, hey, uh, you're part of my rock star team. You, on the other hand, you're my B team. Don't do that. <laughs> but, but you can have an A team and you can have a B team. And what you really want to do is bring back the A team first, and then if business comes back the way we're all hoping for and praying for, then uh, we can we can bring back the rest of the team. So you gotta just be very careful in your hiring. Um, you know, if you have a pregnant employee, if you have someone who's over 65, if you have someone who's immunocompromised, I know the tendency for many of you might be to not bring them back because they might be under threat health-wise. The Department of Labor has made it clear uh, well, very recently that you are not allowed to delay start dates of those employees, despite the fact that they are 65 and above pregnant or immunocompromised in any sort of way. So that includes HIV, it includes AIDS, it includes asthma, um, any of those conditions, uh, you still cannot delay their start date. So my recommendation is start some conversation with them. They may not want to come back anyways, or at least not immediately that will uh, reduce your potential liability there. Now, if we go on to the next slide, what we can talk about there is really what are the basics that when I'm needing to open my office, I should adhere to. And there's a lot of things that you wanna go through when we're talking about this. And so I'm gonna go through a couple of them. The very first thing is something that we are, I think, going to take for granted. And it's important that we don't. And that is to make sure that our teams know exactly how to put on use and take off PPE, okay? That is vital, absolutely vital. Please do not assume that your team knows how to take them on and off. Even something as simple as taking off a glove or a gown uh, needs to be kind of retaught and retrained. And so that is a vital sort of first step in terms of getting your teams back on. The second thing is having them make sure that they know and recognize the symptoms of COVID-19. Now, the obvious ones are fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, those things are, are what the CDC has historically said from day one. Those have expanded a little bit to include other things. And so I would just kind of keep abreast of that and make sure your team knows what to watch out for. That, that's obviously for their own safety, for the safety of the patients, but also of your team's family members, because as you know, if they get it, they can potentially pass it on as well. Having implementation strategies for triaging patients, also very important, very important, right? So if you have patients that are, you know, are diagnosed or are sick, what are you gonna do with them, right? What are you gonna do with them? Are you gonna put them in the private room immediately? That's what we would recommend. Are you gonna send them home and take steps to notify other patients that may have come through the office or your employees? All those implementation plans need to be ready before you are ready to open up your door. So very, very important. Um, same thing happens you know, with your employees. If they get sick or if their child or spouse gets sick, what uh, alternative plans do you have for their employment? So again, very, very important. Uh, making sure that hand hygiene, cough etiquette is, is in place. Um, you know, we are recommending that everyone uh, uh, get, uh, you, know, um, you know, hand soap and things of that nature, um, you know, coming into the office and coming out of the office and every operatory. It is very, very hard these days to get your hands on some of this stuff. But again, very important stuff to know as, as, as some basic stuff to keep in mind as you're preparing to reopen the office. Remember, we're talking about preparing to reopen your office. All of this should be done way prior to your first day in office uh, with patients. Now, the good news is that we all hope that there's gonna be some pent up demand and patients are gonna come back, but you know this gives you some time to kind of prepare, but make sure that if you are bringing back your team for these training days that we were just talking about, that you pay them for it. And if you have gotten a PPP loan from the, from the SBA, then this is a good opportunity to start using some of that money may, uh, maybe. So make sure you talk to your CPA about that. Let's go to the next slide and here, is, is a topic of conversation that I'm sure everyone is gonna ask about. It's that, how do I force my employees to come back too soon? Am I, you know, what do I do about that? And 
this is a reality that unfortunately we all face. And right now, more so than ever, there are movements around the country where certain groups of employees do not want to come back. And honestly, I'm not a scientist. I don't know the facts, but I will tell you, I don't blame people. It is a scary, scary time to be in dentistry. We all know it. But the good news is, is that with proper PPE, with the proper protocols that we're going to talk about in a second, you can absolutely minimize the risk to everybody in the office. And so, so what does that tell us? What that tells us is that communication is key. Right? Communication is vital in this process because if you demand that your employees come all come back on your first day, you might be setting yourself up potentially for some litigation down the road if proper testing and other safety protocols are not in place. Now, I know a lot of state associations are working very, very hard on, the, on, on uh, getting PPE. Henry Schein is working very, very hard on getting PPE for all of you. This is a very scary time because, because the federal government in many instances is coming and grabbing the PPE that people have uh, uh, for hospitals and other institutions. So we are, as an industry, in a really, really tough place, in a really tough place. So the, wherever you can get your hands on PPE, but, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, make sure you stay in contact with your Henry Schein representatives because they will have access to the to to the best uh, out there and make sure you have everything you need. Make sure you have everything you need in the office before opening up. But with that being said, first step is have one on one conversation with your team and say, ask them about whether how comfortable they are coming back to the office. I think if you give them the option, you'll find that most are probably tired of being home, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, and they want to come back to work. And, and some of it might be financial. Some of it might be they just want to get rid of their family members for a little bit and they just want to come back and be safe. And, and so have those conversations. If you have team members that do not want to come back, continue the conversation and say, okay, well, tell me, how do I allay your fears? What would cause you to feel more comfortable coming back to the office? And then as they kind of broach the subject with you, and you, if you've done your part from a PPE perspective, then you can have those conversations and allay their fears. That has worked for our clients nationwide because there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sort of concern about coming back. So, so communication is really, really key. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, and that uh, we're going to talk about short changing workplace safety. Again, the pressure to come back and open up the office is, uh, is, is a very real one. It's a scary one for many of you because you've got a lot of overhead. You may be one of the lucky few who got the PPP loan. You may be uh, in that group where you didn't get the PPP loan. So there is a lot of stress. But remember, don't shortchange any of your workplace safety protocols that the CDC, OSHA, uh, and others are recommending. Uh, and, and there's a real kind of issue here. We have seen plaintiff's lawyers already, already send letters to our clients saying that they've terminated employees incorrectly, that they're forcing people back. You know, uh, and, and it's a kind of a scary situation. We've been able to kind of get rid of these complaints and these demand letters pretty efficiently these days. But but still, you don't want to be on the receiving side of that. So make sure that, you know, the new normal that we've all talked about includes all of the workplace safety things. And don't rush to open it up if you don't have that material um, ready. All right, we can go to the next slide. So uh, mistakes with uh, with health screening. There's a couple of basic things that you know everyone needs to kind of think about, and I'm going to make this a little bit more um, sort of about you know um, about more than just the employees as well. But but really, you know, what we're talking about is that you should have an employee you know at your front door ready to test every patient that comes in uh, with a thermometer, making sure that if their temperature is anywhere near 100.4 or more, that you send them home. We're just telling everyone, look, if they're at 100. Just you know, either either put them in a room if you have to see them on an emergency basis, or send them uh, send them home uh, and to get tested. The same thing applies for the employees, right? You should test them every day before they come in and put that information 
in their employee file. Again, once again, if you are an HR for health customer, super easy. You put it electronically and you're good to go. Uh, if you are not an HR for health customer, you do have to put it in writing. You do have to keep it under lock and key separate from everything else you have uh, in terms of employee records. There is a confidentiality issue there. So please make sure you avoid those issues. Let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, upon reopening, you might uh, find that you know your employees are trying to scramble to figure out daycare. They might figure trying to figure out social distancing mandates. Um, we do think in some states uh, that are following California, Washington, and Oregon's lead, and also New York and uh, lead uh, leads that they are going to require some change to the office floor plan. So we are recommending something, things like plexiglass in the front uh, near um, the reception desk. If you have an open base setup, you know, putting it in between chairs, but they may mandate that, uh, that there be distances between chairs in the offices, in the operatories. And so, so kind of keep those things in mind. We are recommending that in the waiting room, you take away toys and all those things. Uh, you put, you know, those chairs, uh, you know, at least six feet apart or keep family members together if you're going to have them come in. Uh, I think a lot of people are trying to have family members stay in the car uh, and patients even stay in the car until it's their appointment time. So, so that all brings up the question of, well, how do I handle the work schedules? Again, communication is key, but we have seen a lot of folks divide their, their, their office protocols or work schedules where they have a morning team and then an afternoon team maybe extending the eight hour day to 10 hours or 12 hours in some instances. So, so keep those things in mind. Again, communicate with your team, be flexible. Childcare is still an issue for many, many of your team members. Um, now uh, we do have, uh, if we go to the next slide, we do have a hiring resource for all of you. Um, if you text the word COVID-19, it's just one word. Uh, if you text that word to that phone number, you'll get a really great resource from us that shows all the things you need to do as of 2020 for rehiring your team members. Of course, as a, as a partner of, of Henry Shine, we are always available to answer any questions uh, you all have, but, um, but that's a great way to start uh, with something you know, in hand uh, as you get ready to open. So, so Keith, uh, we can go to the next slide. I know you said you had some questions. Um, I'm all yours. Great, Thank, thanks. That was really informative. Uh, thank you, Ali. So you talked about employees and coming back and the timing, and some of them are just gonna refuse plain, flat out refuse. I'll be ready in a month, but yet you've already been scheduling pre-appointing yeah. patients. What do you do about a pure refusal or somebody who says, I want to go on my timeline and that's next month? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very common uh, uh, difficulty that a lot of our doctors are facing right now. And so uh, there, there's a couple of things. One is that it, Technically speaking, if you are open for business and you have work available and any employee refuses to come into work, technically speaking, that person can be terminated. Okay. Now, there are protocols that should be followed. I'm not recommending termination. I never have, not even from the first day of this crisis. But what I can tell you is that they can be terminated in that scenario. What we are advising our clients is to kind of step, take a step back and really decide how valuable this employee is to your operations, how much you value them, how long they've been with you, and to judge flexibility based on those factors. Uh, you can definitely keep that person's job you know, available uh, for them when they feel like they're ready to come back and then you interview them again and see if there's a fit uh, with, with your practice at that point in time. Uh, you might be able to find you know, temporary replacements or whatnot, but we're, we're taking it case by case because uh, there, are, there are real fears. Uh, there are real fears about coming back. Um, I think lack of communication is where things are going to go wrong, right? Where people are going to start reporting their employers to government agencies and other things. I think the key, the key is communication and making sure there's a dialogue. I mean, let's be honest, none of us would be able to do anything we do in our practices without our teams and so and this is a crisis like none other so we have to keep those lines of communication open so that we can make sure that everyone's fears are allayed you know but prior to coming back to the office great 
So in, in the beginning, you actually talked about employee handbook. A lot of practices maybe you know, established one when they opened or relatively after that and haven't looked at, updated, changed in many years. Is this a good time to revisit that? Are there things that you recommend we put in uh, handbooks today? Yeah, this is an amazing time to do it because we have so much time on our hands. At least we do until we open up again. This is a great, great time to do it. And, and you know, Keith, one of the reasons I started HR for Health, you know, many years ago was because there's this sort of myth in dentistry that by just having an employment manual, by just having an employment manual, we're all safe and life is good. And the reality is that the employment manual is step one of many things that an office needs to do to be compliant. But yes, if you don't have an employment manual, absolutely get it updated. This is a great time uh, to do it. Again, you know, uh, you know, uh, HR for Health can do it. It's, it's free as part of our service. We give it as part of what we do and we update it every year for our customers. And so we don't want anybody to go out there and spend four or $5,000 on a manual and then have it be outdated in a year. It's ridiculous. Don't have a lawyer do it. Don't have anybody else do it. You can get it customized to you here. And since you're home, this is the time to get it done. So, Well, you've really, in a short time, given us a lot of great information. Uh, we're very appreciative, Ali. Thank you. My pleasure, Keith. My pleasure. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Great. Uh, next, our, it's a pleasure to introduce Andrea Gallimore, Product Marketing Manager for Henry Shine One. We'll be discussing what business systems you should have in place uh, in your reopening ramp up phase. Uh, Andrea, thank you for being with us and could you take it away, please? Thank you, Keith, and thanks to everyone for having me. Um, it's great to be here today and talk about what we need to look at in our practices and be preparing to reopen. As Ali was saying, this is the time to assess what you are doing and um, or have done in the past and prepare yourselves to reopen and make those changes that are gonna need to be made. So uh, let's talk about um, preparing your office for reopening. One of the most important things you need to do right now is be establishing your office policy um, as you're gonna move forward from this COVID-19 um, situation we've been in and our closures. What are you going to put in place to protect not only yourself and your team, but your patients? Um, we in dentistry, I um, tout that we've done things really phenomenal for many, many, many years. And I know when I worked in a practice, we took extra precautions and making sure that we were um, taking care of our team members and our patients. So I think dentistry has a leg up on this as to a lot of other industries out there. Um, so look at those policies you've had in place, determine what you wanna do going forward, and then be ready to start communicating those um, policies. You're gonna communicate those policies to your team, and I'm not gonna get into a lot about communicating with your patients because Deborah's gonna talk about that with us, but you want to communicate to your team what your new policies are for your office and for the patients that will be coming in. We wanna make sure everybody understands and has that ingrained in their brain and knows what is going to take place as we begin seeing patients again. You know, so for example, are we having patients wait in their cars before they come in? We need to understand all of that. Are we allowing people in the reception area? And we need to make sure we've prepared our reception area for that. So again, key, establish your policy and communicate that information with your team. And it's even good to include your team in creating the office policy. Get them involved and um, make sure they are um, on board fully with your policies. Next is prepare a list of needed items. So be prepared. Prepare that list, begin um, gathering those items that you're going to need. Um, definitely hand sanitizers and things like that. You're gonna need extras of them and we need to start gathering that. Um, don't go hoarding, but go ahead and start getting and being prepared and ready. Um, 
go and create that list because the best way for us to make sure we're doing what we should is create a list and check that list off. Make sure you have those items. And when you're preparing, you want to prepare your entire office, not just one spot, not just the clinical area, but prepare the entire office. Want to make sure you've done some very good cleaning, get the reception area ready. If you're going to allow people in, spread those chairs out, um, minimize it, remove the toys, as Ali said, and just be prepared in that area. Have the necessary tools. The entrance to your building and your office, make sure that's prepared. Um, you may want to have hand sanitizer available right when you walk in. Um, even some policies posted right when you walk in the door for the patients. Make sure your bathrooms are are stocked and ready and your consultation rooms and the other areas in your office. Just make sure you have gone through your list, gone through your new policies and make sure your list has items that need to be covered and taken care of your office in the way that you should and prepare to come back. So from there, we wanna talk about preparing our staff and team members um, for our reopening. And so with that, as I talked about, we want to talk about what the policy is with the team members, and we want to talk about protection strategies with our team members. And again, this goes into making sure the individual team members understand that we're going to be questioning each of them um, in making sure we're screening for COVID-19 symptoms or and any of those symptoms that they may have alerting us and knowing that um, they don't need to come to work and if they're family members, all of that that Ollie covered too, that is protection strategy for the team members coming into the practice, but also what type of PPE are you going to have to protect your team members inside the practice as you begin seeing patients again? What are you going to do for your clinical staff your front office staff, how are you going to protect them? Again, some are putting up like the plexiglass to block the front office personnel off from the patient. Different things, think about those. Go ahead and begin preparing your office. Um, number two, prepare a front office checklist. It's gonna be a little different than what you need completely for reopening, but what do you need to do at your front office section to prepare that area to be clinically clean for your team members. You want to make sure they're not sitting on top of each other. You want to make sure they are protected from the patients and the patients from them. How are you going to be doing things at your front office different now than you did in the past? And I know Deborah is going to get into some of that contact with the patient and how you can um, prepare things to be more contactless, and then prepare your clinical checklist. Make sure you have gone through and taken inventory of what you do already have and what you might need to be looking for and getting now. Don't wait to the last minute. Um, we won't be prepared if we wait to the last minute. And then last, again, discuss your COVID-19 employee screenings um, with your team members. Talk about how you're going to do that for the employees and also give them the confidence that you're going to be screening your patients also and how you're going to be screening patients and that they understand what they're being asked to do. You're also asking for them to make sure your patients are doing the same thing and how you're putting those in place to protect each and every one of you guys um, in the practice that are team members and then the patients coming into the practice. So with all of that as a wrap up, make a preparation, make a plan, create your policy, create your checklist and communicate all of this information to your team members. And then you'll be communicating things to your patients also that Deborah will talk about with us and how we'll begin to all come back together for a successful practice. So Great. Keith, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I know you have some questions for me. I do. Thank, uh, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, the, the the whole world was turning digital before this, and it's 
obviously so relevant and meaningful in the dental world. So does Henry Schein One offer digital patient forms? Yes, they do. Actually, we have um, several different services and depending on what software you're using as your practice management software, we have um, several services that can assist you with um, digital patient forms. Extremely important in this day and age. I know many practices have already gone paperless. Um, and if you haven't, then it's extremely important to do that at this time and go digital with your forms and ask your patients to fill them out ahead of time. and utilize those um, for your screenings and everything also. Great, thanks. Um, let's talk uh, communications. Uh, I know just me personally during this um, crisis that some of the service providers I work with have reached out to me and I really felt an appreciation to them, um, but, and some others have not, but can you speak about what kind of um, mass communication tools Henry Schein One offers? Uh, for offices to stay in contact with their patients, good times or bad times? Yes, definitely. And I know Deborah will get into a lot of this, but we have some phenomenal patient communication services. And even you can utilize some of these services to even communicate with your staff um, and your team members there because you can limit who you're sending to. You can filter out the list. But we have phenomenal services to do that for you. And depending on your practice management software, we have a number of different ones. We have our patient engage um, communication service, which is very well tied to our Henry Shine One practice management solutions. And then we have Demand Force that works very well with other practice management softwares out there, along with Lighthouse 360 and Sesame. So we have a good array of communication tools that can help you communicate to your patients. And some of those even have the integrated digital forms along with them. So excellent time if you are looking to um, over your systems and want to know what might be a better system to communicate in one realm to your patients and um, digital forms. Great time to investigate that, research it, and give us a call at Henry Shine One, and we'd love to talk to you and help you through preparing to open your office back up. Uh, that's really great, Andrea. Thank you so very much. So we're going to switch directions to discuss the patient side, and we're fortunate to have Deborah Nash, a renowned speaker, trainer and author who's been in dentistry for more than 30 years and will discuss how to welcome patients back into your practice. So thanks, Deborah. We appreciate you being here. You're welcome. And it's been, it's great listening to this panel. I've taken copious notes uh, because for those of you who, who know me, you know that not only am I a speaker and a consultant, but that I'm married to a dentist. So I have the trifecta right now going on um, in that I'm helping my husband and, and that practice get, uh, you know, regroup and recover. Uh, my consulting and uh, my speaking uh, business um, is regroup, regrouping and recovering. So interestingly enough, um, amen, and I, we, each one of these experts could have taken this entire time with their topic. I mean, I w didn't want Ali to stop talking because there's so much going on in the legalities of, mm -hmm. of hiring and rehiring. And I, I actually had to be on a phone with an employee today with these very issues. And thank heavens I had amazing resources who could help me. So I felt confident and assured, um, not what my friend's advice gave me, but what an expert, what a professional would give me. So, um, but I'm in a, the trifecta because I've got all of these um, things going on. So some interesting facts that have nothing to do with, with communicating, but a lot to do with communicating. Um, because right now um, we are in a communication overload. Would you not all agree? There are over 350,000 Zoom meetings per day being conducted, per day. So there comes a point, I was telling um, one of my clients this this morning, because it was, I listened to this speaker and hey, I just got off the webinar of this person and I just talked to this person and my friends just said this and I'm on this Facebook blogging thing and, and it's like, I mean, uh, though, some of you may not remember the weight loss guru who used to say, stop the insanity. And I think as I said, it's a lot like right now you are at a crossroads and there's signs that are giving you which direction that, to take. 
and you could go to this little town for X amount of miles. You could go this little town. You could take this path, this trail, and you're standing there staring at this crossroads sign and you're not moving. And you're going to stand there and just wait for another sign. Um, the sign, I mean, you got to make it, people are getting caught up in the weeds of information. And I think it's time to um, take a stand and, and you're going to have to make some movement. Um, states are opening up. Uh, some states are opened up as soon as today, some as Friday, Monday, uh, May 18th, I'm, you know, as late as June 1st, but we're opening up. So there's some things we're going to have to think about. We're going to have to start doing. Um, so if you show the next slide, I've got tons to talk about in a very short period of time. I think what's important to remember is that your patients and your employees are distracted and distraught. Um, as much as we talked to when Ali talks about em employment and forced return and our patient's going to be there, just imagine, um, and Ali says, boy, you know, I, in one respect, I don't blame them. Um, this is a this is an interesting and this is a tough time. But this is actually when, as the employer or as the leader of a practice, your patients and your team members need your comfort, and they need your reassurance and your guidance. This is the time where your leadership skills have really got to kick in. Um, if you've got, if you, you know, there's there's a couple of ways you can look at this. I mean, some people are looking at this that sky is falling. That's one avenue. And some people are looking at it that this is the apocalypse. Um, other people are looking at this as an opportunity to grow and convert and build and rebuild and become better. Um, I think the other thing that is important for us, and I, and I made some notes um, because I'm old. I'm in that category that I'll, you'd have to rehire me because I'm over 65. So you'd have to hire me back. And I'm probably mentally disabled. So um, I'm in all kinds of categories that I'm, you got to hire me back. So here's inter um, interesting statistics. We have had epidemics and pandemics before. They've been um, actually determined since 430 BC. We've had 20 epidemics or pandemics in our world, 20 of them. Now this will be number 21. So, the, but interesting enough that you probably all know if we had a quiz and a prize, um, you know, if I could spit out some sort of charm out of your computer, if you get the answer right, that'd be great. The flu has been the largest, epi the most prolific epidemic we've ever had, starting from 1890, then 1918. I lost my, my, my grandmother lost her first husband in the, pe in the flu epidemic of 1918, 1956, 1968. Those have all been flu epidemics. And then in 2005 through 2012, we had HIV and AIDS. And we lost more people during that epidemic than all the others combined. And we're, we're still here. And we're still functioning. We're still practicing. So I, as we communicate, I think it's important as a leader that even though you're going through the frustrations of how do I hire back and how do I get all the things in place is that when I go in, like the mother and the father, the matriarch and the patriarch of my family, I have to be the one that shows the strength, the confidence and the resolve that we're going to get through this. There's got to be a voice of reason on the team. And, and, and doctor, it, it needs to be you. It needs to be you. Um, here's what's going to happen. Um, and I know Beth's going to talk about cost. Patients are going to have two primary concerns when they go back. And we'll kind of move on to the, to the next. Uh, safety. Am I going to be safe? And what's this going to cost me? And we could go on into whether or not I'm going to charge an infection control protocol fee. Um, if I'm going to add it to my fees, what, am I going to use the D1999 code to, to charge uh, a fee? So um, have those things in place. But when we talk about communication, I first want to say, doctors, you be, you're my top communicator. Um, and so communicate with confidence and resolve that you are going to have solutions. You may not have all the right answers right now because they're changing daily. The protocols are changing daily. The guidelines are changing daily. You think you know what you're going to do. And then at five o'clock, you get an email from your, your board or from your CPA. Uh, that's what happened. Look at what happened with the EIDL loans and the grants and the PPPs and the SBAs. It was insane. Uh, we didn't know, you know, every every hour it was changing. So this is changing. So one of my encouragements for communication is keep your knees bent. My husband has said this forever in our practice. I mean, one of the things to be prepared for, keep your knees bent and tell your team it is okay if we don't get it right for a while. We're going to have to, and we, and I know everyone has talked about this, about practicing, 
practice, 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 practice. I know other things Ali said, get them on payroll. Um, I could talk about this whole PPPs and people freaking out over getting it uh, paid in time or getting it used in time. Uh, the time you bring, for us, the time you bring the patient, the team members back to train is the time their payroll starts. So we, uh, if you're gonna have an opening, for example, May 18th, but you're gonna be bringing your team back to pre-train, which you need to be doing, um, then their payroll starts on the day you're bringing them back to, to train. If, you, if you've if you laid them all off or furloughed them. Um, but here's what's really important. We've talked about soft skills. It's one of my favorite things to do. My favorite things to say is how we say what we say. Um, and, and we still talk about uh, the fact that our words in the past, our words in the past have only um, accounted for about 7% of how we communicate. Your words are gonna mean more now. Um, they've said that body language and tone of voice have been the, the, the largest ways or the most impactful ways we communicate. 55% of the way we communicate with our patient and with people is, is, our, body lang is, is our body language. I mean, think about how you look to your children or you, or you look at your dog for training and it's the way, what's what your body's telling them first. And your words come, and your tone of voice, and your words come third. Um, but how we say what we say is now more critical than ever. And I have to back up on something about, about words and about comfort and confidence. And I think Andrea mentioned it as well. And I think Ali mentioned it um, about leadership and confidence. And I want to think about, um, I'm going to confess something to you. Horses frighten me. I'm afraid of them. People say, oh, they're just big dogs. Okay, I'll take, I love dogs, but big dogs, I mean, a big dog, that can step on me and kick me to death. I mean, they frighten me. I'm intimidated by them. And when I approach a horse, they sense my fear. They, I mean, their the ears go back and they look at me like, please, you're not gonna get on me. You're not gonna be the one, right? Invariably, I get the one, the angry one. And it's not them that's angry, it's me who, but I will tell you, patient, uh, horses sense my fear. And I will, and I'm going to um, use this analogy because your patients will sense your fear. If your team member is not confident and assured when you go back to see patients, your patients are going to sense it. So Andrea talked about making sure that your team is comfortable in your protocols um, and your your processes. That is not only for how you, and I lo love Ali, so you've got to practice putting on the gowns, taking out, there's a, a way you take off these NK95 masks, the way you take off your gloves. But most importantly, we also have to practice what we're going to say. We also have to remember that um, it's going to be even more critical. And I made myself a note because as I was waiting for this to begin, um, I said to myself, What's gonna be really critical now is what we pre-say, because we're gonna be in masks. And we're gonna be talking, you know, and I know I can't touch my face, so we're gonna be, and I should have a mask, but we're gonna be talking like this and, and our eyes are gonna say a lot. I mean, I, I'm in a grocery store with my mask on and I look at somebody and I'm smiling and I said to them, I can't believe I'm smiling under my mask because you can't even tell. And the woman who I, I smiled um, to her at the, in the grocery store and I said that, and she said, but I can tell it in your eyes. I can tell you're smiling in your eyes. So that's going to be most important for your team to understand that their body language, what this is saying and what the rest of the body is saying. Uh, I, I can't touch anymore. I can't hug anymore. Uh, no more hickeys. We can't do those anymore. Um, so it's going to be careful. Move me on to the next slide because I could, you know, go on. And how we say is important. I think it's important for you to think uh, we talk about communication and Andrea talked about signage. What are your signs going to say? I mean, you have to be careful that you're not going to have signs that say, danger, 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 don't come in here. Um, you know, big red hazard. Make sure that you are using words like for your comfort. I mean, your sign, can, you're going to probably have a sign at the front door. You're going to have to sign for your, um, it's going to be sad to not be able to say hello to the FedEx guy anymore and the UPS guy. We love him. But he's going to have to go through another entrance and he's going to have to leave the boxes outside. Uh, we're not going to be able to like visit with him anymore. So I've got to have a sign for my my UPS and my FedEx driver where he or she is going to place the deliveries and how they're going to do that. So there has to be a protocol for accepting deliveries. But I want to make sure that when we rather than we say wait or hazard or stop here, um, don't come in, 
how about if we start saying things like for your comfort or while you're, while you're in our care or welcome back and then we can go through the protocols of how they're going to prepare um, when they come back in another sign um, for example um, I know Ali talked about all the amenities that we are going to have to take out of our reception room and one of them is probably many of you listening to this uh, um, have a coffee station in your reception room you have a Keurig not anymore you don't have a Keurig machine anymore in your coffee in your reception room you can't offer coffee anymore so so um we have a coffee station in our office and guess what it now is going to be called and i feel like i'm doing a sesame street um segment because it's going to be called the sanitation station so you just like remember the conjunction junction it's not going to be the sanitation station and we have to lead our patients to the sanitation station and we have to have a signage that helps them understand and explain the protocols of wearing the mask, uh, sterilizing first, putting the mask on, sterilizing after, whatever they're gonna do. So, but make sure that when you do post signage, make it friendly signage. Don't make it danger, danger, you, you are entering a hazardous area. What's my next slide say? I don't even know, could be a picture of my dog. Um, ah, yeah, okay, so welcome back. I wanna make sure that your team avoids apology statements. I was watching uh, a webinar the other day and the speaker, of, I have a great I respect for her and admire her. However, she was using terms like, unfortunately we have new policies. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but you're gonna to have to start wearing a mask or I'm sorry, but we're going to have to um, now assess a infection control protocol fee. We want to avoid words like, I'm sorry, but, because when you hear that, I'm sorry, but we can't do that for you. I'm sorry, but that's not our policy. Basically says to your, your uh, patients, you're not gonna get what you want. And you're not gonna be happy with what I'm gonna tell you that you're gonna get. So we wanna avoid um, starting sentences with I'm sorry or unfortunately. And so we turn that around and say, why are we doing this? I mean, why are we doing this infection control protocol? And why are we following the guidelines of the CDC and the North Carolina Dental Society and the ADA for our patient's comfort? While they are in our care, they feel safe and secure that we have their health at our utmost responsibility and priority. Those are the words you wanna use as opposed to, I'm sorry, but we have to do this. I'm sorry we have to put on this this yucky stuff, this stuff, this yucky mask. I would make it fun. We, we could uh, talk about social media and how it could be really fun that we actually videoed our patient, putting our stuff on. Uh, Dr. Nash, my husband, took a picture of the an emergency yesterday, and he has a picture of Dylan wearing her stuff. And I said, oh my gosh, we need to post this. This is, this is what you're going to expect. You're gonna start seeing, this is what you're gonna see. So we'll talk about that. Um, email to patients, go ahead and prepare them for what they expect. Send them a video. Send them a video of what the office is gonna look like. The amenities are gone. Um, the coffee station's gone and this is why. This is how, this is how we're gonna look now with our masks and our shields and our, and our gowns and our, um, our bonnets. And what are we gonna do? So use social media to, um, to communicate to your patients. Uh, email your patients. I really love that Henry Shine One has combined everything. So it's almost like a one-stop shop for patient communications. Andrew, you could nod your head because I know you're muted. Wouldn't you agree? You make it makes it simple to communicate to the patients. You should have been doing it while you've been closed at least once a week. Um, now you should be preparing your patients for we're coming back and here's what you can expect. And you can communicate through social media. You can communicate making a video. Why video? Is because you will increase your viewership by 95% if you are showing a video as opposed to just a posted email or a posted text message. Not that those aren't important to have, but if you add video, if you add something fun and helpful, you add the doctor speaking to the patient, you're gonna increase readership and you might even increase its ability, your patient's desire to share it with someone else. We did one in our backyard and people, uh, and Dr. Nash, my husband, I, I won't tell you what I call him at home. Um, uh, he was wearing his slippers and, P, and our patients come back and said, it was so fun to see Dr. Nash in his jeans and his slippers with the dog. So make it friendly and folksy, take a look at that. 
You're going to need to change your appointment conversation, your confirmation conversation, and you're going to need to practice that scripting. What questions do you need to ask 48 hours prior to the patient coming in? What questions do you need to ask one day before the patient comes in? So you, you need to be in touch with them 48 hours prior to to ask their screening questions. And I'm sure that Henry Shine One documents have a pre-screening questionnaire that I can send to my patients to complete prior to their arrival. I wanna make sure that, it has, that I have received that. Um, I wanna make sure that my tone of voice is critical. I want, I, I want to avoid sounding tentative or hesitant. I need to sound comfortable and confident. And maybe it's the time, although I'm gonna see myself behind a, a sneeze guard. Can you imagine they're calling those things sneeze guards? Um, it's kind of, you know, the barrier the, that you can buy inexpensively or that you hang from the ceiling or you hang on your counter or my mask. I have to make sure that my tone of voice is coming through as being helpful, welcoming, considerate and caring. So not officious, not policy. I don't want to I want to avoid saying something like uh, Mrs. Smith. This is Deborah from Dr. Nash's office. I need to inform you of our current policy because of the COVID-19 crisis. And when you come in, you're going to have to stay in your car and don't bring anybody with you. And they can't come in the reception. I want to avoid that tone of voice. We are here to keep you, to make you safe. And if I lower my voice and if I lower my tone and if I sound gentle and caring, then I'm going to have a more confident and compliant patient when I come, when I have, to, when I have to make a statement to them. And most of us, when we have to make a statement to our children or significant others, and it might be an uncomfortable comment, the best thing we can do is say, honey, I have something I need to tell you. We don't say, honey, I have something I need to tell you. You don't have a great listener if you start the conversation. So patient, I have some great news. We have adopted the most current, the most technologically advanced infection control protocols to keep you safe and healthy while you're in our care. I know you're looking forward to seeing us as much as we're looking forward to seeing you. We've missed you. So we want to make sure that our tone of voice is critical. We want to prepare a very positive statement regarding our infection control protocol um, using videos. What's my next picture? I'm, they're probably getting ready to get the hook and get me off, but I think I'm almost, yeah. Pre-screening questions, have your appointment, uh, your appointment call ready. And the important, the important thing is that when you finish your um, required questions that you're asking the patient, you should always make sure that you give your patients the opportunity to, to answer, to, to ask their questions. So you need to ask them, what questions may I answer for you? You know, I know you you probably you you've been um, you've probably watched some sort of television or webinar or social media. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for us. What questions can I answer for you? I can give you all the time you need to make sure that you're going to feel comfortable when you come in. Remember your and I think it's important for you to remember your patients want to screen you as much as you want to screen them. So we're always talking about this pre-screening our patients. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, your patients want to know what have you been up to. What have you been doing? How have you how have you protected yourself? And what are you gonna what have you done to be sure that I am safe? Some of the questions and be prepared. Train your team. One of the questions may be: Has anybody in your family been tested for COVID? Have you been tested for COVID? Do you have the anti antibodies for COVID? Have you done your your fit test? Has anybody on your team been tested for COVID? Do you know that all of your team members have been quarantined for 14 days and they're all been sheltered in place and they're all safe? Be prepared to answer those questions. Next, create a list of, of uh, frequently asked questions. I just talked about that. Make sure that you go through what could possibly be the questions our patients are gonna ask us. Let's create a list. Our team is gonna create a list of those questions and let's make sure we have the answers, not scripted. Um, and I mean, you can practice, but make sure that doesn't you don't sound robotic when you're answering the question. But be prepared for the questions that I just described, the, uh, the questions. What have you been doing lately? What have you been up to lately? lately? Have you kept yourself safe? Um, have you been wearing masks at the grocery store the whole time? Telling your patient first what you are doing and how you have kept yourself safe and secure is information. Telling them afterward is an excuse. So give them the information ahead of time. Ask yourself, I had a great employer one time. Um, well, I've had lots of great employers. Uh, but I remember an employer saying this, tell them the information, give them the answer before they have the opportunity to ask. 
Give them the answer before they have the opportunity to ask. And I think that's important. So create a list of patient frequently asked questions related to returning for care and practice with your team, work with your team. So I know that um, my thing is be critical. What's my next picture here coming up? I think it's probably, um, yeah, me. I think um, it's critical for us to practice our, our office flow. Scheduling is gonna be a nightmare, ladies and gentlemen. That's gonna be your toughest thing to think about, how you're gonna schedule your patients. Um, how, how are you going to take the gowns on and off? How are you gonna, where are you going to store the gowns? How are you going to dispose of the gowns? But how are you going to communicate to the patients is going to be absolutely critical. What sort of post-appointment follow-up care calls? I would put that on your docket. You've got to call your patient after 24 hours after they come in. How are you feeling? How did you feel about being in the office? If you're feeling really great, if you're having a good hair day, you might want even to ask the patient, you know what, would you mind making a, going on, um, and writing a review about how safe and secure you felt while you were in our care, it really meant a lot to us that if you would say that you felt that you were absolutely protected 100% of the time while you were here, it really meant a lot to me if you, you, would, if you would put that on in a Google review for us. Um, there's going to be a, re, a importance for more connection through technology more than ever before. You know, I mentioned that the, uh, the more we can pre-say and the more we can post-say, because we're not going to be able to say it the same way now with our masks and our gloves and our face shields and our sneeze guards. We're going to have to pre-say it and we're going to have to post-say it. You're going to have to find new ways to offer above and beyond service that are going to be new and innovative for you. Um, and it's a lot of it's going to be using this, using your voice and using your words. They're going to be more critical than ever. What's next? Um, next slide. Oh, it's that. So, so I, I'm, this, I could have spent hours and hours and hours talking about this, but I really think it's great. I want to say one thing as I introduce my dear friend, Beth. This is, I know, Ali said, this is scary going back. Um, it's, it's, it's uncharted waters. I sent a note to my patient, my team, and I'd be happy to, if they're going to share my information, happy to send the notes I've been sending my teams every week. And today I sent the note. I said, I feel like I'm in um, a rescue boat off of the Titanic. I'm in uncharted waters. The Titanic is sinking. I wouldn't want to be in any other rescue boat than the rescue boat with my team because they're smart, they're innovative, they're passionate, they're committed, they're bright, bright people. And we're going to get saved. We're going to get, we're going to be saved. But I, I love this quote that I, that I heard this morning. I am a quote person. Um, cause right now some of you feel like you're knocked down. And I heard that five to 10% of doctors aren't, are going to close their doors. are not going to come back five to 10%. I've heard that. Um, and actually one of my clients said, hey, there's going to be practices to buy. Yeah. But here's the quote. You don't lose if you get knocked down. You lose if you don't get back up. And once again, I could offer a prize if you know who, who said that. Ben, I know you probably know who said that. It was Muhammad Ali. You don't lose if you get knocked down. You lose if you don't, if you, you lose if you stay down. So don't stay down. Get back up. You're going to do fine. Wow, uh, th that's really uh, amazing. Uh, uh, we really thank you uh, so much, Deborah. It was really inspiring uh, as well. Um, it's it's uh, we're appreciative. Thank you. So next up to discuss uh, financing options, and it's really more than financing options, but for patients and how to make them affordable is Beth Johnson, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Care Credit. And I could add a lot to her title. Uh, she's been a good friend of the dental industry, good friend of uh, Team Shine, and we're very fortunate uh, for you to make time in your day as well, Beth. So uh, thanks for being here. And patient financing, how do you see that playing a role in this uh, pandemic? So first and foremost, Keith, I'm gonna practice what I just learned from Deborah. You all audience, I have share with you. You're going to enjoy and be so comfortable with all of my recommendations. And Ali, by the way, they've had us safe and sound at Synchrony sent us home, and we're going into our seventh week of self-distancing and quarantine. So we are very, very safe. And Andrea, I make lists every day, because without those lists, I wouldn't be here right now. So with no further ado, Keith, your question, so pointed and so wise today. How do I see patient financing playing a role in this pandemic? Well, I've been in business for a while. 
and I've been through a few things. I started in dentistry. I have never seen a time where patient financing is more relevant and important than it is today. I don't know any other way of putting it out there. Uh, a lot of people are saying payments and I don't want to do this and I don't want the system, but I'm going to tell you it's never been more important. And if you doubt me, I'm going to turn to the ADA Health Policy Institute. They just reported out on April 23rd. And I give you dates because everything is very fluid. Isn't that a new word for us today to use? Environment, things are changing so quickly that we have to adapt. But one of the things they told us is that our current volume of collections is less than 5% of what is typical. Wow, 5% of what is typical. Furthermore, the decline of the provided care uh, for uh, 2020 is about up to 66%, a little scary. And it's projected in 2021 to be around 32% of what we do today. So if that being said, cash flow, is the most important thing that practices need so they can recoup lost revenue, they can cover uh, their overhead, they can help with their current needs of supplying the safety materials. And oh, by the way, if that's not enough, so they can pay their teams and oh, by the way, doctor, you need to be able to have a living yourself. So cash flow is really, really important. And, and that being said, um, I also have to say that there may be fewer patients. Uh, we're going to have to make some changes and a higher need for treatment acceptance and um, the acceptance of recommended uh, care and maximizing your production. Those are all words that sound so cold, but they are a cold reality of truth. I wouldn't say a different word. So um, um, when practices identify the roadblocks to patients coming in, I think that all of us have identified it that people first and foremost are scared. You know what the scariest part of all is? They have finances and concerns that they have. And oh, by the way, in our communication, as Deborah alluded, if we talk about finances up front before patients come in, we will find out were they employed? Do they have benefits anymore? Do they prefer to hold on to their cash and their credit cards? Do they need some support there? So while um, I I'm going to confess, I started dentistry when I was five. Just kidding. I've been in dentistry a long time. And I do remember when I was in the practice offering treatment plans, setting up protocols and systems, we never talked about money on our website. Never. Never. We never talked about it over the phone. Um, it was something that was done face-to-face -face so that we could really, as Deborah said, have that eye-to-eye -eye conversation with our patients and be able to get into the mix of it. I'm going to tell you that that does not exist today. That yeah. not talking about money is, sets up a barrier, and it's a roadblock that you're going to have to overcome if you don't open the door. And, oh, by the way, patients are expecting you to talk about it today. They want you to talk about it. Um, it is the catalyst for them to come into your practice because they are not afraid of it because you've addressed it already. And there's a lot of ways to do that. There is a lot of ways. I encourage you to use, and I'll get into it a little bit more in depth, but I want you to know the unsaid um, word of finances has got to change where we look at it in Dentistry Day, upfront and conversations so that we can um, ease their concerns and fears and provide the options. If you doubt me, I have a customer service center that, okay, you want to talk about challenges of bringing home teams out late? Bring home 17,000 employees. Try that. Uh, try to do sales distancing in a customer service center and making sure that you keep your team in place. And I'm very proud, and I share this with you, I'm very proud of what Synchrony has done for their employees and care credit and given us the opportunity to be safe so that we can come back and serve the profession so well. Um, I, I, I say that um, when you address their fears and you no longer hold on to them and you give them options, um, you too will have a winning solution for a patient that's easy to communicate with and come into the practice. Um, Keith, I think you have another question for me out there that you wanted me to respond to. I do. Yeah, there's a few that have come to mind. So how are you supporting practices? You work with a lot of practices across America. How are you supporting practices and patients right now? Uh, is there anything you can share? So 
So um, what are some of the best practices I can share out? Uh, uh, um, time is of the essence. I can't stress when I say best practices, how can I help? I'm going to ask you to help yourself. Don't be the bank. Please don't be the bank. Remember cash flows, King. Um, remember that also that collection calls are not fun. Uh, statements. You're going to have to do communication. I've said if you have outstanding balances, you're actually going to have to have conversation before a statement, after a statement, and oh, by the way, if you don't handle it right, your business brand will be tarnished. And you won't have to worry about poor calls for them to come back because they won't. Right? Um, you can, and, and oh, by the way, um, utilize your banking relationship. Leverage your banking system. They have systems and analytics in place. Um, 15,000 calls a day right now. If you don't think patients don't want to talk about money, 15,000 calls easily in a day for people calling. And we have the systems in place to ease their fears, give them the opportunity to leverage their time, their efforts. And I don't think when you're concerned about cash flow, rebuilding your practice, you have those same things in your practice. Let me be your banker. Let me do the work. Uh, we're geared up to do it, and we're good at it. Um, I'm also going to tell you to leverage teledentistry today. Um, Deborah was talking about how um, your patients and videos and everything. Oh, by the way, Deborah, clever video about PPE. They would did it to the uh, they did it to the hokey pokey. They put the glove on the tape. Anyway, I'm not I'm not a singer, but you get what I'm saying. I think communicating out in that in teledentistry before they come in gives you the opportunity for you to have them not only open up and speak with you, but to leverage your time in the practice. If you've had those quick conversations, so I am a fan of teledentistry. I'll leave it up to the experts about how they're going to charge for it and everything else. I happen to think it's a way of you communicating that should be free. And uh, leverage your time in the practice by producing. So um, those are my personal thoughts about that. I, I think you need to start in your practice with the people that called while you were, while you were um, self-distancing and have your practice closed. Follow up with your emergencies. Invite them in. And, oh, by the way, yes, communicate. Not only that you're safe and all the things and precautions you put in place, but make sure you address the financial concerns as well. I think that's a win-win solution for everyone. Um, I think there is important, and this is important, while we were, I've never worked harder in my life than from home during this time period. It's because we had processes that Care Credit was working on to make your life a lot easier beforehand that we can bring some of these um, these systems and turnkey opportunities to you that patients need today. They need a way to be able to pay you today without walking up and into your office and handing you a credit card. So I'm gonna get into a little bit about that, uh, some of the things that we worked on that are available today uh, for you to take advantage of. Um, so that's one of them. Um, also, you know, what's my action plan on some of this? Um, I have 200 people that are ready to help support and engage you out there. They don't have to be in your practice. You can do it in a WebEx. We're not allowed to Zoom. You can Zoom us, but we can't Zoom you. We have to WebEx you. But we are prepared to walk you through the steps so that you can offer some of the things we have available. I need you to use your integrated software systems. Make your time count. Um, for those of you that have, um, for example, Dentrix and Easy Dental, if you're on version 7.1 on Dentrix, or Easy Dental, which is 12.1, I want you to know that, that uh, those integrations not only set up and do applications, but oh, by the way, they transact and go directly into your ledger. Let's be smart about these things. Uh, we have QR codes that literally can be sent to your patients where they can apply as well as transact without being in your office. That means you now can receive payments in your office 20, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. It's a great thing for you. So um, these are just some of the ways for you to contact us um, about those um, opportunities that I just mentioned. They're easy to use. Um, they're, uh, and patients are used to using this, and they love it. They absolutely love this, this flexibility. Um, if you could go back for just one moment, I'd like to follow up. Um, and Keith, um, I'm just going to let you know that in following up and helping our, our, our practices um, during this time, um, as I said before, people want more options. What I'm showing you right now, um, it's not just about affordability. It's about how it fits into their lifestyle. It's about how they ho want to hold on to their cash and preserve their credit cards, which, by the way, bear interest for them the moment they charge. 
Um, they need longer plans, to be honest with you, so that they can stretch out their payments. So when Care Credit was looking how we could support the practice, we need to make sure we were supporting your patients so they would say yes. So um, in our dedication to help the profession for three months, from May 1st to July 31st, uh, we have reduced the merchant fee on 18-month deferred um, interest plan down to the cost of the 12-month deferred interest plan. And this is how it works. Um, once approved, you offer the 18 months to pay with deferred interest, you transact the 18-month deferred interest promo, and you'll only be charged a 12-month fee. I think you'll find that this really truly does um, help our patients give them more time to pay, which is what they're really asking for. I know 15,000 calls a day is a very big reminder to us of what they're asking us for. Could you go back to that, that other slide? These are some of the devices that make it so that the practice does not have to do the heavy lifting. Let our patients help us help them. If we're able to make payment portals and applications available for them, whether they're an emergency patient before they come in, we also have marketing kits and banners from our website um, at thecarecredit.com. Find these things, add them to your website to use those integrated systems. I can't say enough about patient engagement systems and the opportunity they bring to you. By the way, we're integrated on many of them. Um, Lighthouse 360, they're beautiful setup for the communication for your success. As I close up, I have to say that I'm very proud, I'm very proud to have a wonderful partnership with Henry Shine. I'm very proud of it. And I want us to continue to work together to support the dental profession um, during this time and into the future. Uh, those Henry Shine providers that aren't currently enrolled with Care Credit, I'm going to enroll you right now without an enrollment fee. That's what I want to do here. I want you to take a benefit of what we can bring to you. I uh, would love to help provide resources and support in every way that we can. So I leave you with those thoughts. I appreciate your, your time. And do the right thing. Give us a call and let us serve you. Thanks, Beth. So uh, th thanks to all the real wonderful speakers. So I just wrote notes myself. And the summary, what, what I'm, some of my key takeaways are about how important it is to be proactive and communicate clearly, how much uh, our dental teams and patients mean everything to the practice. It's important to express how much you really care and to do it authentically. And I think that real is really universal came through to me and hopefully others as well. So thank you for uh, tuning in today, everybody. We want to thank our panelists again for their insights uh, and for joining us. If you have any questions regarding the topics that were discussed, feel free to contact any of the appropriate parties. Thank you all and stay well.